Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Before starting our webinar, please join me in remembering the victims of the December 7, 1988 devastating earthquake in Spitak, Armenia, and recognizing all those who assisted in that time of need. The resolve of the Armenian people was severely tested back then, but always resilience and hope have since overcome despair. Pursuant to the institution of the World Genocide Commemoration on December 9, 2015, AGBU, with the vision and initiation of AGBU's worldwide president, Mr. Bertset Rakyan, has made the conscious decision to support this resolution that had been introduced by Armenia and encouraged HBU chapters globally to observe the United Nations International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide. Over the past years, with the support of AGBU Lebanon's president, Mr. Gerard Tufankchian, and its strict committee, December 9 events have been marked, covering extensively the legal aspect of genocide and its prevention, the international protection system, and the role of the state, the importance of education in genocide prevention, the significance of international and local civil societies, the role of the media, the ability of the international system to control hate speech and incitement to genocide, and the root causes and consequences of the genocidal violence against women and girls. Today's webinar will focus on genocide in light of cultural destruction and the construction of narratives and memories. Our speakers will also talk about the role of memory as a form of prevention against genocide and how museums and memorialization can help in providing justice to the victims. Of course, we couldn't have established this platform to highlight about past and current genocides happening in the world and shed light about prevention without our partners and collaborators, particularly AUB's Hissam Ferris Institute, the Independent Research-Based Policy-Oriented Institute, and the Lapsius House in Potsdam, the Genocide Studies Center in Germany, who have been with us since 2016. Today, through this webinar, we pay tribute to Dr. Rolf Hosfeld, who served as the academic director of the Lapsius House. We're honored to have worked with a person who has initiated numerous regional and international research and education projects about the Armenian genocide and the history of humanitarianism. Since Rolf's major publication on the Armenian genocide in 2005, his contribution on the topic via articles, interviews, radio features got more public attention in Germany. Rolf undoubtedly leaves behind an inspiring legacy of standing up for truth and justice against all odds. May his soul rest in peace. And now, please allow me to invite Dr. Joseph Bahout, the director of the Isam Faris Institute, to deliver his opening remarks, after which I would pass it on to Yeria Tashtian, the Institute's senior fellow, to start the panel. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think that this, uh, this very important webinar is held uh, in memory of, of many people and many persons. Uh, you mentioned uh, Rolf Hosfeld, you mentioned also the Armenian people. I would like to start very quickly, I won't take time, but by um, remembering a very famous uh, story uh, that, that is uh, of high significance in, in the context that we are discussing today. Uh, during, first, uh, during the Second World War, um, the British Minister of Culture came to uh, Winston Churchill, then Prime Minister, and told him uh, the war effort is becoming very costly and we need to make uh, very severe budgetary sacrifices. We need to, uh, to choose where we put the money. And probably in times of war now, we should maybe uh, decrease the budget of the Ministry of Culture because this is really not the time for this. And so answer look, uh, uh, Churchill looked at him and he answered, but tell me if this is so, why exactly are we fighting for? I think that this is a, a very telling uh, story because uh, contrary to what many could think, culture, heritage, issues of memory, 
collective identity are not a side uh, show. They are not a gadget besides uh, uh, hard politics. They are at the core of national construction. They are at the core of collective memory. They are at the core of identity. They are also uh, many times related to economy, to knowledge economy, and to other economic aspects. So it's really at the core of any sustainable uh, policy construction. And this, this story of Churchill, I think, should uh, stay with us when we think about uh, any attack or any attempt at diminishing culture in, in our societies. Uh, nothing, I mean, attacks or uh, diminishes culture, heritage, memory, and, and things related to that, like wars and genocides and aggressions. We have seen this recently in the region, in the Middle East region, in Iraq, in Syria, in Palmyra, uh, more specifically under the hands of, of ISIS. We have seen it also um, elsewhere being attacked by uh, air raids uh, that are indiscriminate, that, uh, that do, uh, uh, let's say, uh, wide scale destruction. And so I think it's necessary today, and this is why this webinar is important, to reflect upon the politics of culture, the policies of culture, but also the policies and politics of preserving culture and heritage in times of turmoil, in times of war, in time of uh, mayhem, and in time of uh, genocide uh, as well. This is why uh, I think that this webinar is utmostly important, and I, I salute the choice of having uh, picked up uh, this uh, theme tonight. Uh, as uh, for us at IFI, we are very proud and very happy to be uh, holding this kind of webinar for the fifth year now with uh, AGBU. And I, uh, I really take pride of that. IFI takes pride of that. We are very happy that we are doing this venture together every year. And I really hope that we will continue this way. And uh, the, the, the pace and interest of our webinars is a testimony to the success of, uh, of this choice and of this partnership. So thank you, AGB, uh, AGBU. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, uh, Arine. Uh, thank you all for being here. I won't be uh, longer than that. I will hand it over to my friends and colleagues here to uh, moderate the panels and to, and to take the floor. I wish you uh, good luck for these two hours and really thrilled to follow the debates that are uh, going to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. First of all, I want also to express my uh, gratitude to both AGBU and um, IFI AUB for organizing this important and uh, timely uh, event. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Roy Igno. Uh, Dr. Roy is a deputy director of the Left House Postem and also he's an associate lecturer um, at the University of Potsdam. Uh, his paper is titled The Loss of Words, Genocide, Culture, and uh, the Challenge of Plurality. Welcome, Dr. Roy. The mic is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. And on behalf of the Lapsus House, I would like to thank the AGBU Lebanon for the cooperation now for the fifth year in a row. And it's always a pleasure to work with you, Mireille and Arin. Also, a big thank goes to the Islam Fairs Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University, Beirut, for hosting this event. So the topic of my short intervention um, is to shed some light on the connection between moral evil and the loss of cultural heritage from a cultural studies and philosophical perspective. So the common understanding of genocide refers necessarily to mass killings of people. Although cultural aspects of genocidal violence are not explicitly mentioned in the UN Convention of 1948, there is a historical and contemporary understanding of cultural genocide. And I will share with you two quotes. Can you, can you read it? Can you see it? Okay. So the first one is the historical um, aspect I want to um, build on. So this is uh, um, a quote um, from Raphael Lemkin uh, from the October 1933, before he even coined the, um, the, the, the phrase genocide. 
and um, there was a conference uh, about the unification of panel law in Madrid and Lemkin participated and uh, did a draft um, on acts of barbarity and acts of vandalism, which could be quite interesting for our discussion. I just read the, um, the quote. Um, an attack targeting a collectivity can also take the form of systematic and organized destruction of the art and cultural heritage in which the unique genius and achievement of a collectivity are revealed in fields of science, arts, and literature. The contribution of any particular collectivity to world cultures as a whole forms the wealth of all humanity, even while exhibiting unique characteristics. Thus, the destruction of a work of art of any nation must be regarded as acts of vandalism directed against world culture. The author of the crime causes not only the immediate irrevocable losses of the destroyed work as property, and as the culture of the collectivity directly concerned, it is also all humanity which experiences a loss by this act of vandalism." Uh, end of quote. So this is from 1933. And the other quote is from the UNESCO, which you still find on the homepage today um, from a meeting in Paris in 1972. And there you can read, I quote, considering the deterioration or disappearance of any item of cultural or natural heritage constitutes a harmful impoverishment of the heritage of all the nations of the world, End of quote. So both quotes are based on the idea that groups or a collectivity are entities that have a certain value for humanity, which is a cultural added value. Talking about irrevocable losses or the wealth of all humanity or harmful impoverishment um, is meant to express that cultural diversity is a good. But how can such a view be justified? Why should cultural diversity be a desirable goal? I would give you two arguments um, today. I mean, there are more, but I think two arguments um, to support the assertions made in the quotes and therefore frame cultural destruction as a form of genocidal violence. So the first argument um, I call the argument of value pluralism. Value pluralism is a reaction to moral monism, which reduces all moral questions to only one possible answer at a time, using one value or a group of values as criteria for evaluation. According to some philosophers like Isaiah Berlin, Moral monism has been the dominant paradigm in the history of mankind and has promoted authoritarian and utopian political ideas. For if there is only one value-based answer to a moral question, then there is only one correct way to lead one's life or to organize social life in a society. On the other hand, there is a different experience, especially in a digitally connected global order. There is a choice of experience a choice to adopt to different cultural worlds. With that, I do not mean that every choice can be realized, but the possibility to choose between different cultural and moral perspectives. So the question of cultural diversity is thus answered implicitly. If there is a value in being able to choose between different cultural and moral perspectives or views, then this value is reduced if the pool of choices dwindles. Thus, if groups and collectivities that constitute cultures are destroyed, then the basic human mode of free choice is limited. It is therefore necessary to strive for and maintain cultural diversity. The second argument I call the argument of memory and plurality. So this is based on a reading of uh, Hannah Arendt's thoughts on totalitarianism, history, and human condition, and goes like this. Um, because people are able to remember there was a past at all. In memories, the words and deeds, the joys and sorrows of the past find permanent place in the world. Acting, thinking, and judging are not possible without memory. Every new beginning is rooted in the past and based on the experiences and actions of other people. Every thinking is strictly speaking an after thinking, as Arendt puts it in, this, in, in her words. 
Every judging is dependent on the experience of the past, which appear from different perspectives and become the subject of a common public conversation. So memory thus always depend on the presence of others. It is the world between people constitutes this world and influences everything present in a special way. And it needs this world in order to exist at all. The victims of genocidal violence are therefore not only people or individuals, but also the memory of them. That means from the perspective, perspectives of the genocidaire, people and their acts of memorialization must disappear from the face of the earth as if they had never existed, along with their words and deeds, which are still in the world and the form of the memories of others or cultural objects who can testify to them. I think we will hear about this later on uh, in detail and in the case studies as well. Therefore, it is above all the relatives and friends of the victims who are most likely to pick up the trail of memory and make it visible. Under genocidal conditions, they are absolutely forbidden to speak or must also disappear. Hannah Arendt proved the extermination camps to be the genocidal institutions par excellence for testing how extensively even the memory of people can be erased. From the moment of his arrest, no one outside the camps was ever to hear from the prisoner again. It was as, he have, he have, it was as if he had been swallowed by the ground and have never existed before. Arendt therefore also refers to the camps as caves of oblivion. Wherever memories and by the same token, cultural heritage as forms of material memorialization find no place in the world, people's words and deeds fade away without becoming a part of reality. Judgment thus loses its object and becomes completely superfluous. In this way, the destruction of memory, cultural reality and judgment go hand in hand under genocidal conditions and continue far beyond the collapse of genocidal societies. It is our task not to be silent, but to remember and to preserve so that the manifold richness of the world is not drained by violent forms of societies. So much, uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roy, for this interesting and important uh, presentation. Uh, now we are moving forward for our panels. We have two panels, actually. Our first panel is about cultural intervention, interventions and uh, as prevention. Uh, our panelist is Dr. Hernar Wotenbach. Uh, she's a professor of art and architecture at the University of California. And she recently published a book uh, called The Missing Pages, The Modern Life of Medieval Manuscript from Genocide to Justice. Uh, Dr. Hernan will be talking about the cultural heritage and human rights. Uh, the mic is yours, Doctor. Thank you so much, Yeria. I'm going to share my screen. So thank you all and greetings from California where it's um, early morning right now. Um, today I will explore the links between cultural heritage, religious heritage and human rights from my perspective as a specialist in the history of art. Uh, experts have long recognized the close links between the intentional destruction of cultural heritage on the one hand and discrimination, ethnic cleansing, and genocide on the other. The destruction, theft, or appropriation of culture are central elements of the genocidal process, not merely collateral damage. Perpetrators destroy the culture, especially the religious culture of the targeted group. War creates conditions where art can be stolen and trafficked. We have seen this in the Armenian genocide, but we have also seen this repeated in every other genocide and mass atrocity globally since then. Um, as was mentioned already, as early as the 1930s, Raphael Lemkin, the Polish Jewish jurist who coined the term genocide, noted with concern that the, that the intentional destruction of culture accompanied mass atrocities, what he termed at the time vandalism. In spite of his interest um, in this aspect, the destruction of culture was not included in the United Nations legal definition of genocide adopted in 1948. Yet recent research about the human right to culture shows that assaults on culture are part and parcel of genocide. 
One of the great human rights challenges of the last century has been to bring justice on behalf of communities who have had their culture destroyed and stolen from them and to prevent assaults on culture from happening in the first place. A driving concept in international cultural heritage today is the ideal of world heritage. This idea emerged following the assaults on cultural heritage that were part of the horrors of the Second World War. The idea of world heritage holds that significant works of culture belong to all of humanity. While specific types of heritage have particular resonance for and connections to particular human groups, all of humanity has a link to such objects, which represent the quote, cultural heritage of all mankind, unquote. International organizations such as UNESCO are built on the idea of universal heritage. It is conceived as being positive, celebratory, politically neutral, and beneficial. It aims at preserving the best of the culture of humankind for future generations. Over the years, special international protections have been created to safeguard cultural heritage in, terms, in times of armed conflict, such as the 1954 Hague Convention. In 2003, the international community reaffirmed its commitment in the UNESCO Declaration on the Intentional Destruction of Cultural Heritage. And yet, these standards are not always upheld, and states have not always fulfilled their obligations. In recent years, UNESCO and World Heritage, the idea of World Heritage itself, have been criticized for many inequities and failures, including the failure to prevent or deter the destruction of heritage, especially during conflict, and the failure to impose consequences for the mistreatment of heritage with any consistency. Increasingly, activists and legal experts call for a human rights-based approach to cultural heritage. They argue that cultural heritage is also a human rights issue, which is best tackled through a human rights approach. Traditionally, cultural rights have been seen as less important than, than such fundamental human rights as the right to life, to equality, or to health. This prompted the UN Human Rights Council to, re to reiterate that, quote, cultural rights are an integral part of human rights, which are universal, indivisible, interrelated, and interdependent, unquote. In recent years, cultural rights have gained in legitimacy in many different areas. The effort continues to demonstrate that cultural rights are key to the overall implementation of universal human rights. Cultural heritage is deep, deeply linked to other human rights, such as the rights to freedom of expression, freedom of conscience and religion, as well as the economic rights of people who work in industries related to heritage. The intentional destruction of cultural heritage then can be described as an assault on cultural rights, but also on other human rights. Acts of deliberate destruction are often accompanied by other serious assaults on human dignity and human rights. As such, they have to be addressed um, in the context of holistic strategies for the promotion of human rights and for peace building. The destruction of heritage as part of conflict is unfortunately a global phenomenon today. In an international system, in an, in an international legal system based on states, the duty to safeguard cultural heritage, especially UNESCO World Heritage Sites, such as Palmyra, which you see on the screen, falls primarily upon the state that is home to such heritage. However, during civil conflict or war, states might be unable or unwilling to safeguard heritage, and sometimes states might even be party to destruction. In the international heritage system, it is states that are key actors. This may create difficulties for groups that are disempowered within state structures because they are indigenous communities, minority groups, groups subject to discrimination or underrepresentation. The more recent case of Nagorno-Karabakh shows very poignantly that the destruction of cultural heritage is at the center of conflict rather than an unfortunate side effect 
and that the destruction of culture is part of a repertoire of violent acts and assaults on human dignity. This is the Cathedral of the Holy Savior, known as Hazan Chetzot, in the city of Shushi. It was built between 1868 and 1887, and it is one of the largest Armenian cathedrals in the world. It holds a number of sacred relics. During the war on October 8, 2020, it was shelled twice in the same day while civilians were sheltering inside. The cathedral became a symbol of the international destruction of culture, and it prompted an international outcry. Since the ceasefire, the cathedral has come under Azerbaijani control. Major rebuilding activities are taking place in the city of Shushi before any assessment or monitoring or input by any range of stakeholders or international organizations. In early May, reports emerged that the Azerbaijani government had dismantled the famous tall umbrella dome of the cathedral. This is ongoing without any consult consultation or input from key stakeholders, like the Armenian church or the Armenian residents who have been displaced. Many believe that this is a destruction in disguise. It is certainly being done in a top-down, exclusive, and opaque manner. There is no information about the relics and religious objects in the church. In addition, Armenian officials, uh, church officials and worshipers are not allowed to visit or conduct religious activities. We see here the interdependence of religious rights and cultural rights. International cultural institutions issued statements calling for the protection of cultural heritage in Karabakh. Here you see a statement by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and here a statement, one of several statements by UNESCO. Um, in Karabakh, we are seeing once again the power of states as compared to the limited range of options for minority or indigenous communities. UNESCO announced several months ago their determination to send a monitoring team of cultural heritage experts to Karabakh. However, Azerbaijan has not allowed UNESCO to visit. When a state is, oh, let's stay there. When a state is unable or unwilling to protect heritage under its control, the local and international communities are hobbled, even paralyzed in their responses. This is a major problem in international cultural heritage. Indeed, few international instruments have the teeth to defend cultural rights and cultural heritage in danger beyond simply issuing statements of concern and publishing watch lists of heritage in danger. International cultural heritage professionals and activists can only intervene with the permission of the state where the heritage is located. Monitors are unable to visit cultural heritage sites without permission from the state in question or are unable to visit freely without control and surveillance from the state. What then should the international community do when a state home to endangered cultural heritage is intransigent, unable to act, or worse yet, maybe itself threatening cultural property? It is critical to take a historically rooted multidisciplinary approach. We must also take into account the voices and concerns of local communities and even displaced communities when applicable. These are the voices that are most often ignored or marginalized. In the best models of uh, positive change in situations similar to this, cultural heritage has been mobilized as a medium for dialogue and eventually peace building, as in the case of the Bicommunal Technical Committee on Cultural Heritage in Cyprus. Yet such initiatives are very difficult and fraught. Too often, cultural heritage is politicized and it is instrumentalized to punish and humiliate one's opponents. This is hardly a path to end conflict and to promote lasting peace. In general, groups advocate for the protection of the cultural heritage that they care about, that they have an affiliation with. From a human rights perspective, however, one has to take a broader universal approach we need to look at the entire range of threats to heritage and to everyone's heritage. It is critical to mainstream a human rights approach 
and that requires a universal and inclusive approach to cultural heritage. Cultural heritage should be neither a weapon nor a target, but rather a basis for peace. Uh, now, actually, we are moving forward uh, to our second panel, uh, Museums and Memorialization, Communicating a Form of Ongoing Justice. Uh, it's a rich panel where we have five case studies um, and five uh, speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Ahmad Rashid Salim. He's a doctoral fellow in the Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures at the University of California. Uh, we'll be talking on pain and poetry, Afghanistan's culture between society and state violence. Welcome, Doctor. The mic is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation and opportunity. At the peak of the Taliban suffocating rule over much of Afghanistan, the country's most celebrated and influential modern poet and scholar, who at the time was living in exile, finished the last line of his work, Bayan Namaye Warasane Zamin the manifesto of the inheritors of the earth. The work's architecture using a structure strengthened by wit, irony, eloquence, reference to the imagined past of Afghans and the reimagined now of the Taliban, erects a damning critique of the Taliban's worldview, hypocrisy, contradictions, and incongruence, according to the author, with what was and is both within the drawn lines of modern Afghanistan, as well as the Islamic and pre-Islamic intellectual and cultural traditions. As a result of this work, the author, Wasif Bakhtari, had to flee to avoid the promise of death from the Taliban. What the Bayan Nama attempts to do is what I will try to do in these moments we share with each other, strive to make sense of the utterly senseless and offer a memorialization of both pain but also poetry. Afghanistan is a nation of minorities, contrary to an insistence by some connected to centers of power and the abuse of power, there's no ethnic majority in Afghanistan. What is rather clear is that there is a majority language in Afghanistan and that is the Farsi or Persian language. This language and its derivatives are spoken by the majority of people living in Afghanistan and it has served as both the language of administration until very recently, and also the lingua franca of the country. Moreover, the unmatched prominence and reception of its literature, primarily poetry, has situated it as a unique marker of culture and enculturation. It bears mentioning that one of the unique features of the Farsi language is that it's not confined to one ethnic group of province. Rather, we see writers, poets, and artists whose native tongue isn't Farsi, choose to write in Farsi. However, there has been a program of deterring, diminishing, and replacing Farsi with the Pashto language by the state. This policy has attempted a number of abrupt and intentionally malicious acts, including arbitrarily changing the name of the language, insisting that all instruction be done in Pashto, censoring and censuring Farsi scholars, poets, and speakers, renaming sites as an act of erasure, and with the first reign of the Taliban, insisting that the only official language of the country be recognized as Pashto, and shifting the language of administration, governmental offices, law, and public discourse to Pashto. In other words, weaponizing language as a tool of erasure, oppression, denial, and prevention to ensure individuals and communities do not succeed in preserving and memorializing history and culture. For some in the audience, their first notion of cultural destruction in Afghanistan may be linked to the destruction of the ancient Buddha statues in Bamiyan by the Taliban. However, destruction in Afghanistan has been present by different means and intensities for generations. Many sites, sources, scholarly voices, and more importantly, innocent lives have been eliminated in Afghanistan. Different rulers and political forces, ranging from the Iron Amir to the Marxist Hafizullah Amin, from the infamous Dr. Najibullah to the numerous Mujahideen groups, and of course the brutal reign and destruction of the Taliban, have led to assault, violence, destruction, looting, war crimes, and forms of genocide against civilians in Afghanistan. Many of these atrocities are renewed against the same groups in different ways. However, the brutality and callousness of targeted killings, displacement, and torture have three main historical actors. The so-called Iron Amir, Abdul Rahman, led a psychotic genocidal campaign against his political opponents. 
The climax of this being the brutal assault on areas occupied by Hazaras, what is referred to as Hazarajat, leading to mass killings, imprisonment, and enslavement of Hazaras. The various communist governments holding the reins of power from 1979 to 1991 were responsible for the displacement of half of the country's population, mass murder, torture, imprisonment, and targeted killings of prominent scholars, teachers, writers, artists, thinkers, and regular citizens. And finally, the Taliban's reign from 1996 to 2001, and since their takeover on August 15th of this year, in large part thanks to the so-called Doha peace talks brokered by the United States, has deployed an abrupt and extreme program of death and destruction across the country. This violence is so expansive and encompassing that it leaves one delirious and dumbfounded. From what men and women are allowed to wear, the types of haircuts men can have, the complete ban on music, the destruction of musical instruments, denying women the right to work, banning women and girls from access to education, applying takfir or stating that individuals are non-believers and thus subject to murder to anyone who politically or theologically disagrees with the Taliban, the deployment of suicide bombers, particularly against the Shia population, banning foreign movies, stopping the country's thriving free press and media, bringing the country to the verge of mass starvation, and much more. What is unique to the Taliban's extreme ideology is the erasure of everything and everyone but themselves. Thus, as I speak to you, Uzbek and Turkmen peoples are being attacked and forced out of their native lands, as well as Shamalis, Hazaras, and others. The revitalization of the literary scene in Afghanistan after three decades of war is no more. Same goes for the rena renaissance of art in Afghanistan. Most of Afghanistan's new wave of artists are either in hiding or have fled the country in the chaotic and despicable man-made catastrophe we saw unfold at Kabul airport. The Taliban have already erased the vibrant and colorful murals, stencils, and socially conscious and politically active art, which had covered the walls of the country's cities, primarily in Kabul, with black and white text hailing the great victory of the Taliban Mujahideen against the West and infidels. How do we delineate culture and where do we stop when discussing the impacts of cultural destruction and violence that inevitably erupts into various forms of mass violence? Is denying over 25 million women the right to don the colorful and embroidered dresses of their culture violence? Is the genocide in the province of Panjshir one of the most serene and beautiful places in Afghanistan violence? Is silencing the sound of music and song violence? Is burning libraries violence? Is turning Afghanistan into the world's primary supplier of opium, a status that the country did not have prior to 1979? violence is denying the population self-determination and equal representation violence is stoning men and women violence is publicly torturing lashing and parading a young boy who's forced to steal a loaf of bread for his family's survival violence how about the destruction and looting of natural resources of the national archives housing precious and rare mainly unstudied manuscripts violence and all of these and more are clearly acts of violence how do we then impact, how do they then impact and deteriorate culture? How can culture and heritage remain unharmed in the face of such calculated and broad forms of violence? These events, whether in Afghanistan or elsewhere, also highlight the collective and international responsibility to end it and aid our fellow being. It is here that the role of language, of literature and song in general, but of poetry in particular in the case of Afghanistan, aver a resistance to the suffocating chokehold of violence. Returning to Wasif Bakhtari's The Manifesto of the Inheritors of the Earth, he encapsulates the historical and the inherently present forms of destruction embodied by the Taliban. This manifesto is offered in a very eloquent and sophisticated manner and attributed to the tongue of the Taliban. It says, we love Parda, barrier, curtain, veil, from which the Arabic barzakh is also uh, derived, for the reason that with a bit of handiwork, it metamorphs into barda, slaves. And isn't it so that thousands upon thousands of slaves befit us? The most glorious annals of history are those that glorify the Stone Age, 
death even to bronze, how deviant were those who benefited from bronze. Look how in the end they've hidden two letters of the word deception, durugh, in the word bronze, mafrag. Bronze is banned, as is the case with lying. The universe is ours, the earth is ours, time is ours. We've heard that the fools of the earth honor a polluted slit of paper. It seems the satanic paper is called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. At the onset, we intensely sought distance from it, but we cogitated, what better proof for our absolution? Well, what wrong have we committed in the North and South, the Occident and Orient, and in all the black and white houses of the world, this polluted slit of paper is deemed unworthy. We dislike much of the Farsi words which end in D. Know that D is from the alphabet letters of the non-believers, henceforth expunged from the lexicons, liberty, azadi, development, abadi, joy, shadi, generosity, radi. However, barbadi, destruction, is an exception, for the rarity is exceptional and the exceptional absolved. Barbadi, destruction, should be written in all manuals of learning in conspicuous script. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, I know it's a very important topic because uh, years ago, uh, unfortunately, no one could have imagined that Taliban would have come to power again and continue its genocidal policy. It seems, unfortunately, history is repeating itself. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Simon Makian. Dr. Makian is the coordinator of uh, community development at ANCA. Uh, I have been actually following uh, Dr. Makian on social media, and, and he has been one of these voices uh, who, is who is raising actually about uh, the destruction of, and vandalism of the Armenian cultural heritage in Nakhichevan and also the occupied parts of nagorno karabakh uh, who will be talking about the politics of cultural erasure uh, in the region, mainly in South Caucasus, especially in uh, Nakhichevan and the occupied parts of Artsakh. The mic is yours, Doctor. Thank you so much. Uh, um... Uh, for the to the organizers to you yeah yeah to everyone uh, for this opportunity to speak today it is an important day just an hour ago the international court of justice in the hague uh, made a decision in its uh, provisional order regarding armenia's uh, request to stop destruction of armenian sacred sites that are under azerbaijan's control um i'm still trying to understand what the full uh, decision meant, but it seems like from from reports and the the, the quick uh, uh, watch of the proceedings that that the request has been granted, um, which is I think huge for um, uh, for this cause of cultural preservation. And so I just wanted to to share uh, that news with with everyone. I also have to uh, mention I, I hate correcting introductions, but I I have not. Uh, uh, Completed my doctorate yet, but I but I appreciate the uh, the, the kindness. I'm I'm currently um, I'm working on my PhD at, at Cranfield University in heritage crime. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and talk about my 15 year investigation into the destruction of cultural monuments in the South Caucasus. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the subject, you probably already know everything about it. For those of you who may not be familiar. This is going to sound a little shocking and sensational at first, um, but it took myself uh, about a decade to proceed to process all of this information uh, and, and to come to terms with, with the scale and scope of the massive destruction that we're going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen. I have many slides, but I, I promise I will uh, go through them very quickly and I will stay within my allocated time frame. So we're going to uh, start with looking at uh, the monitoring of cultural sites in the areas that are now under the control of Azerbaijan following the 2020 war in Nagorno-Karabakh, or Artsakh, as Armenians call their indigenous region in this uh, ex ex uh, enclave uh, with, within the internationally recognized borders of Azerbaijan, but uh, a de facto Armenian state. 
uh, that now has shrunk to the dark green area that you see on this map. Outside it are the areas that are now under Azerbaijan's control, and uh, Caucasus Heritage Watch is looking at 275 sites that are being um, controlled by Azerbaijan. Not everything, in fact, majority of the monuments have not been destroyed so far. But the reason why there is so much concern is what happened in another region called Nakhijavan, which was also historically rich in its indigenous Armenian heritage of approximately 28,000 cultural properties, uh, a majority of which were tombstones and uh, cross stones, but also 89 surviving houses of worship. And I learned about this issue in December uh, 2005, when the army of Azerbaijan was deployed to one of those sites called Jura in Armenian or Julfa internationally. This is where the world's largest medieval Armenian cemetery existed on the border with Iran, but on Azerbaijan's territory following the collapse of the USSR. And in here, we witness Azerbaijan's army deploy over 100 soldiers to wipe out centuries of Armenian history. In fact, uh, the first satellite investigation into cultural destruction was the case of Julfa in 2009. At that time, there were limited satellites. So the AAAS looked at what had survived of the cemetery following earlier cases of destruction. You can see in the flattened land here that there was further or earlier destruction, but most of the cemetery was still intact. And in the 2009 image, you see it has completely disappeared with close-ups in here. Uh, earlier this year, I utilized um, further satellite investigative mechanisms to look at other examples of cultural destruction in this region. And we looked at the declassified uh, corona spy satellite maps, then end up using the Hexcon KH9 program that was disclassified in 2011 to look at the most historic Armenian town in Nakhijevan called Agulis or Ailis in Azerbaijani, which became famous a few years ago when Azerbaijan's most courageous novelist Akram Ailisli wrote a novel, novella about this. And here uh, we looked at the different Armenian cultural properties that existed um, in the Soviet era as documented by the, so the CIA satellites and then their complete disappearance in subsequent uh, imagery and replacement in one example um, with, with a mosque. We have here uh, one of the most remote Armenian sites in Nakhijavan in Azerbaijan, up in the mountains of Agulis, another monastic complex from the early medieval era, a major Armenian uh, pilgrimage site that Akram Ailisli describes in Stone Dreams as the Mecca and Medina for Armenians, also completely erased, although this is the exception of the, being the only Armenian cultural site in Nakhijevan that because of its terrain, even after the destruction, you can still see the outline of the cultural complex because of its rocky terrain. Another example of the complete wipeout is uh, St. Jane or, or um, uh, St. John the Baptist Surpovanes uh, Church in, in Agulis. You see complete disappearance. And interestingly, here, there used to be a tomb to a priest who shaved off the he heads of his students to make them look unattractive when Shah Abbas was visiting in the early 17th century to prevent the students from uh, being re uh, kidnapped for, for the Shah's harem. Uh, and so we'll, I've looked throughout the last 15 years of four examples of evidence. One is satellite. Uh, and one is eyewitness testimony. The other one is public decrees or the state archives. And uh, the last one is crowdsourced photography, visual imagery. If things appear on social media that we can overlay with 
historical photography of the region to see what the terrain has turned into. Here you have an example of eyewitness testimony by researcher Steven Sim, who managed to sneak into the region. You're not allowed to conduct um, uh, uh, independent research in this region. And, and if you're Armenian, regardless of your citizenship, you're not allowed to visit at all. But Steven Sim managed to sneak in and see what had been left of uh, a major Armenian cathedral. Uh, this is a photo of it taken in the 80s by um, Argamay Vazian, an Armenian researcher, uh, and someone from Europe actually visited the sacred terrain a few years earlier, and he shared this photograph with me. Now, um, there's only a few examples where mosques have been built, where churches used to stay. The purpose of the destruction is not to completely... Um, replace Armenian sites with Azerbaijani sites. On the contrary, uh, there has been local boycott by uh, the residents, the Muslim residents of especially Agulis of the mosques because they were built in places of churches. So this was committed by the Azerbaijani uh, government, the local authorities who say that the destruction did not happen because non-existing sites or cemeteries cannot be destroyed. So they're saying the monuments did not exist in the first place. In interestingly enough, this was a response to, to this very investigation. And this was one of the uh, examples uh, shown at the ICJ uh, in the request to stop the destruction of further churches. More examples of, uh, of um, the archives that show the destruction of Armenian monuments, including an order in late 2005 to survey every monument in it uh, for seal of Azerbaijanism, meaning if, if anything did not meet that criteria, they were not fit for existence. And a summary of that, acknowledging indirectly the complete erasure of Armenian monuments. I also want to quickly talk about a uh, case of Islamic monuments under uh, Armenian control in, in the region. Uh, obviously, it was not perfect preservation. Azerbaijan says that 63 or 65 out of 67 mosques have been raised by Armenians. This is not true. Uh, in that region, only two mosques have been destroyed, one under Armenian control in circa 2016. Here's satellite imagery. And one more recently under Azerbaijani control, you see to the left in the construction of a uh, road, this historic mosque that Azerbaijan's government was saying Armenians had vandalized was completely flattened. Destruction of any cultural heritage, heritage is wrong but we want to make sure that it does not um, continue in this region that's under Azerbaijan's control. Here you see the wife of Azerbaijan's president inspecting Armenian monuments. She proclaims fake because the propaganda in that country says Armenians are not indigenous uh, to the region. And so all of their heritage is fake heritage. Here you see destruction and desecration of cultural sites during the war. Uh, um, the documentation by Caucasus Heritage Watch of destruction of cemeteries that have just happened throughout the last few months. And major sites here for your review that are under Azerbaijan's control that are at risk, if not immediate, but long-term destruction. It's important to mention that the destruction in Nakhijavan started eight, 10 years after Armenians were banned from the region. So destruction doesn't happen right away. And finally, uh, just a final thought that uh, uh, reflecting on this meeting between the Armenian and Azerbaijani religious leader, the Catholicos and the Sheikh Islam that happened in Moscow, which was uh, in some ways a hope for a breakthrough. Um, hopefully they, they will advocate for a mutual pilgrimage access to sacred sites, because as we have seen in Iran, that has helped preserve Armenian churches. And the alternative, of course, to, to not having any sort of access is what happened in the world's largest medieval Armenian cemetery of Julfa, which I visited in, two, in 2013, a flat field instead of centuries of history that the people of that land had created and enjoyed. And I'll, I'll end my presentation here, and I look forward to if, if there are any questions. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Makian, for this important presentation. Also, just to make a small note that uh, Mr. Markan is one of the Artsakh research grants research from the AGBU uh, program. So thank you uh, a lot for your researches. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Uh, Marcos Papadomoulos. He's a publisher and also the editor of the Politics First magazine and also an expert on uh, Russian politics. 
he will be talking about the uh, Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict and unheeded warning from the past. The mic is yours. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin by commending the Armenian General Benevolent Union, the Isam Faris Institute, the Lepsius House Potsdam Center for Genocide Studies, and Al Maidin for organizing and hosting today's pertinent conference. Furthermore, I would like to express my profound appreciation to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to speak here today. In 2018, Countries across the world commemorated the centenary of the end of the First World War. Yet during those commemorations, few people were aware that under the cover of the Great War, a genocide was perpetrated, a genocide of horrific proportions, a genocide committed against an ancient people who preceded Christ and are referred to in the Holy Bible, a genocide perpetrated against a people who are the heirs to one of the greatest of civilizations in human history, a genocide which resulted in the almost complete eradication of all traces of this ancient people's existence on the land where the mass murder occurred on, a genocide committed against one of the most peaceful and pious of Christian peoples and indeed of all peoples that exist, and a genocide which stands out from others on account of how powerful states in the world have long sought to suffocate public awareness of it. Accordingly, the Armenian genocide is one of the most overlooked acts of mass murder in human history. The Armenian genocide, perpetrated by the Ottoman Empire, which modern day Turkey is the successor to, resulted in the heinous deaths of in excess of one and a half million Armenian men, women and children from 1915 to 1923 and the near eradication of their rich and enlightened culture, which had inhabited Anatolia since ancient times. Today, the Armenian catastrophe is compounded by the stance of Great Britain, which, incessant on preserving its strategic partnership with Turkey, denies the Armenian genocide, making the British state one of the leading and most notorious of all genocide deniers on the international stage. The stance of the British ruling elite on the mass murder of the Armenian people means that the possibility of another genocide being committed against the Armenians cannot be precluded. Given that the British state is one of the most powerful and influential in the international arena, and on account of London's denial of the mass murder of the Armenians, it follows, therefore, that awareness of the Armenian genocide in the West and in the world in general is comparatively low. After all, to underestimate the global reach and influence of British mainstream media, such as the state-owned BBC News, is exceedingly foolhardy. Thus, London's position on the Armenian genocide helps to provide cover to the Armenian people's two mortal enemies, Turkey and Azerbaijan, both of whom are ardently unrepentant for the annihilation of, Anatolia, of Anatolia's Armenian population. Whilst Britain, as previously mentioned, has a strategic partnership with Turkey, London closely guards its lucrative economic relationship with Baku, which is centered on Azerbaijan's position as a major energy supplier. However, the British state is not alone in denying the Armenian genocide and attempting to downplay the abominable suffering of the Armenian people at the hands of the Turks from 1915 to 1923. The Israeli state is another example of a powerful force in the international arena, which not only refuses to recognize the Armenian genocide, but has also sought to keep the spotlight off the catastrophe that befell the Armenian people, so as to help preserve the strategic partnership which has existed between Israel and Turkey for approximately four decades now, and to also maintain Israel's strategic alliance with Azerbaijan an alliance that grows in intensity year on year. To demonstrate the reprehensible Israeli stance on the Armenian genocide, I will quote a line from an Israeli foreign ministry document from 1982. We continue to act to reduce and diminish the Armenian issue to the extent of our ability by every possible means, end of quote. 
Israel's morally revolting position on the Armenian genocide means that the country stands alongside Britain in being one of the world's main and notorious of genocide deniers. There can be no true memorialization of the mass murder of the Armenians by the Turks without universal awareness of this diabolical chapter in human history. And there could be no way of preventing another mass murder of the Armenian people by either or both the Turks and the Azerbaijanis without universal recognition of the Armenian genocide. Towards the end of 2020, hostilities, though not a full-blown war as a result of the stabilizing force that Russia constitutes in the South Caucasus, erupted between Azerbaijan and Armenia over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh, which was the second time that Baku and Yerevan had fought one another over the aforementioned territory. One of the key factors as to why there was little interest in that fighting from societies globally is by reason of the pitiful and lamentable levels of awareness in the world of the Armenian genocide. Conversely, if global consciousness of the mass murder of the Armenian people during the Great War was at the levels of awareness of other genocides in history, then it is plausible that people in the world would have acquainted themselves with the fighting over Nagorno-Karabakh and, in doing so, would have learned of the terrible menace posed to the Armenians by the Azerbaijanis and their kindred spirit, the Turks. To put it simply, a race who are the victims of a widely known genocide and who are subsequently at war will inevitably attract significant levels of global public attention. Today's, street, today's strategic alliance between Ankara and Baku is built on the common ethnic, cultural and spiritual ties between the Turkish and Azerbaijani peoples. That partnership is enhanced by the Turkish and Azerbaijani states shared loathing of the Armenian people. Such is the inflammatory language emanating on a regular basis from Turkish and Azerbaijani politicians, journalists and academics about Armenians, that it is conceivable Turkey and Azerbaijan would, if they could, embark on a campaign to replicate the murderous actions of the Ottomans from 1915 to 1923. Azerbaijani enmity towards Armenians predates the year 1988, when tension between the Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic and the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic over the contested region of Nagorno-Karabakh emerged. For it was in Baku in 1918, when Azerbaijani hatred of the Armenian people truly manifested itself for the first time, resulting in the massacre of 30,000 Armenian men, women and children in the city by, by Azerbaijani nationalists who had allied themselves with the Ottomans. Then in 1920, with the Russian civil war raging and the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic, ADR, having declared Azerbaijani's independence from Moscow in 1918, the forces of the ADR systematically murdered Armenians living in the city of Shushi in Nagorno-Karabakh. Furthermore, in the final years of the USSR from 1988 to 1991, when the central and previously all powerful control of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union began to disintegrate as a consequence of Mikhail Gorbachev's catastrophic policies for the Soviet people of Glasnost and Perestroika, the Azerbaijanis began a, ca a campaign of ethnic cleansing against Armenians living in the Azerbaijani SSR, including murder, expulsion, abduction and rape, with one of the worst cases having occurred in the city of Kirovabad, today known as Ganja. Finally, during the first war between Azerbaijan and Armenia over Nagorno-Karabakh from 1992 to 1994, the Azerbaijanis again carried out pogroms against Armenians living in what was then the newly independent Azerbaijan, such as the Maragga massacre. Today in Azerbaijan, as has been the case since the country became independent 30 years ago, hate speech towards Armenians is one of the Azerbaijani state's key characteristics. From the president to his ministers, to journalists, to teachers, Racism towards and hatred of Armenians is ingrained at all levels in Azerbaijan. Thus, 
Armenians are routinely referred to by Azerbaijani politicians, including the president himself, as infidels, barbarians, animals, dogs, and corrupt. While some politicians have gone even further by calling for the complete elimination of the Armenian race. The result of official sponsoring and espousing of hatred of Armenians in Azerbaijan is that many Azerbaijanis, especially the young, perceive the Armenian people to be barely human, with death to Armenians often chanted at political gatherings in Azerbaijani towns and cities. The Turkish state, which, as I said earlier, has a strategic partnership and a cultural and spiritual affinity uh, Dr. John. Dr. Marcus, I hate to intervene. You have less than one minute, if you can please summarize. Thank you. I, I will be very quick. Is also notorious for hate speech aimed at the Armenian people, which includes not only Armenians living in Turkey, such as in Istanbul, but Armenians in general. Suffice to say that whenever there has been an outbreak of hostilities between Azerbaijan and Armenia, or whenever the Turkish security forces have engaged in fighting with the PKK, the Armenian community in Turkey is filled with dread and anxiety over what the physical consequences for them could be at the hands of not, on, of not only Turkish officials, but also of ordinary Turks who have long been conditioned by the Turkish state to seethe with anger and hatred at merely the very word Armenian. The inciting language emanating from both Baku and Ankara about Armenians passes not only unpunished, but largely speaking, without notice in the world, including at the United Nations. The primary reason for that deplorable silence is due to the strategic importance attached to Azerbaijan and Turkey by countries such as Britain, America and Israel. To put it simply, in the eyes of London, Washington and Tel Aviv, geostrategic politics and economics surpasses morality and ethics. Or to put it another way as concerns Turkey, Britain and America will adopt any course of action which they deem necessary to defend the key NATO member that is Turkey. Whilst the probability of another genocide being, again, being committed against the Armenian people is low on account of how Russia, again a global superpower, is the traditional guardian of Armenians, such a scenario materializing cannot be entirely excluded. So for instance, if the Russian state was to collapse and if Russia was to subsequently fragment, as what happened following the Bolshevik revolution, then this could lead to an outbreak of wars in the historically volatile Caucasus, in which the Azerbaijanis, aided by Turkey, embark on a genocidal campaign against not only Armenians living in nagorno karabakh but in Armenia itself. In such a scenario, the Armenian people, deprived of their Russian protectors, would be alone in facing the wrath and hatred of the Azerbaijanis and the Turks, with Britain, America and Israel adopting a, sign, a stance of indifference to the spilling of Armenian blood. Thus, the Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict constitutes a warning from the past, but one, alas, which is not being heeded in the world. Owing to, for instance, the behaviour of the British state, knowledge of the Armenian genocide, the ethnic cleansing of Armenians by the Azerbaijanis, and the inflammatory language used and espoused by Azerbaijani and Turkish officials towards Armenians is unheard of in most societies across the world. Accordingly, the mass murder and persecution of the Armenian people is a largely untold chapter in human history. For that, states such as the British and Israeli ones deserve the contempt of each and every right-minded right -minded man and woman wherever they may res reside in the world. It is abundantly clear, therefore, that the torment and suffering of the Armenian people must be relentlessly and extensively told while simultaneously confronting and exposing for what they are the genocide deniers of the world, such as the British state. There can be no proper and meaningful memorialization of the abominable crimes committed against the Armenians by the Azerbaijanis and the Turks and there, unless there is global awareness and recognition of these accursed acts. Until then, the ancient, enlightened and peaceful people that the, the Armenians are will remain at risk to another genocide. Our thoughts and prayers should be with the Armenian people. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcos, for towards, actually we are heading from South Caucasus towards uh, the Middle East, and our fourth speaker is Dr. Ali Nashmi. He's a researcher and historian, and he will be, he will be talking about the cultural genocide or the iconoclasm in Iraq by the hands of um, ISIS. He will be talking in Arabic, so you can find, you can click on the interpretation just for translation at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. 
Shukran, Jazin. I, I, I can't speak English, but uh, you want to choose various sources for this uh, material. Then I think it's quite okay. Uh, but I will speak Arabic. I think there are many of the listeners of the Arab. The truth is that there is a problem in the genocide and the social justice that the human rights أقول بأنه إحنا استخد... سمعت كثيرا من المتحدثين الأفاضل عن استخدموا كلمة minorities حقيقة كلمة minorities أقليات هذه كلمة أحسها كلمة عدوانية لأنه عندما تقول أن المجتمع تكون من أكثرية وأقلية في زمن الديمقراطية والحياة الديمقراطية تتحدث من خلال أو تتحدث من خلال صندوق الاقتراع هذا يعني الأقلية سوف لن تحصل على شيئا كبيرا جدا لا في البرلمان ولا في السلطة ولهذا فإنها هذه كلمة أعتقد استفزازية هم مكونات أصلية هم الشعوب الأصيلة الشعوب التي كانت صاحبة الأرض ثم حصلت هناك هجرات لأسباب دينية أو سبب اقتصادية وغيرها وبالتالي أصبحوا هم أقلية والآخر أصبحوا أكثرية وذلك يجب أن نسميهم المجتمعات الأصيلة أو المكونات الأصيلة أعتقد هذه الكلمة أكثر مواءمة في هذا الموضوع هذا من جانب من جانب آخر أساسا الثقافة كيف تتكون هذه الثقافة لا تتكون بيوم وليلة إطلاقا بل هي تأتي من خلال التفاعل الكبير ما بين مجتمع ما وتلك الأرض وما بين هذا المجتمع والمحيط وبذلك هذه هذه الثقافة والكالتشر تتكون من خلال مئات السنين وأيضا ألاف السنين ولذلك تكون ثقافة لكل مجتمع تصبح له ثقافة وكل قطعة من الأرض تصبح له ثقافة تبعا لهذا التفاعل الذي حصل ما بين هذه المجموعة والأرض والمجموعات الأخرى المحيط بها ولهذا عندما تحاول أن تستهدف ثقافة ما أو عنصر ما مهم جدا في تلك الثقافة فهذا يعني أنك تدمر الثقافة الأخرى يعني نحن الآن في العراق استهدف المسيحيون واستهدف المسيحيون وهذا استهدف الشيعة بصورة عام هذه هي المكونات العراق يتكون من شيعة وسنة وأكراد ومسيحيين ويزيديين وشبك وتركمان وإيدها هذه تكون المجتمع العراقي ولكن طبعا هنالك يعني أكثرية إسلامية وهناك مجاميع أقل وهي من المكونات الأصيلة التي نسميها البعض بالأقليات عندما نقوم بنقل هذه المجاميع من أرضها أو نستهدفها أو نختالها أو نقتلها أو نهمشها فبالتأكيد عنصر أساسي من الثقافة في ذلك المجتمع ستنتهي حتى عندما نحافظ عليهم وننقلهم إلى مجتمع آخر يعني الآن هناك محاولات لتهجير أو أو ليست محاولات وهناك أصبحت قصدية في استهداف الثقافة المسيحية من خلال وجود المسيحيين في العراق واستهداف الثقافة اليزيدية من خلال استهداف الأزيديين في العراق عندما تنقلهم وتحافظ عليهم تحت مسميات وشعارات بأنه يجب أن ننقل هذا العنصر خارج العراق لأنه الآن في العراق توجد أزمات فإنك بهذه الطريقة أولا ستقضي على ثقافتهم يعني الأزيديون عندما تنقلهم إلى ألمانيا أو إلى أمريكا سيكون هناك مجاميع صغيرة عوائل صغيرة ضمن المجتمع الألماني والمجتمع الأمريكي الجيل الأول قد يحافظ على اللغة والديانة والثقافة ولكن الجيل الثاني سينتهي وبالتالي أنك ستساهم مساهمة فعالة في تدبير تلك الثقافة وفي تدبير ذلك العنصر الأساسي الذي ساهم مساهمة فعالة جدا في الثقافة الإنسانية والثقافة العراقية المسيحيون أيضا استهدفوا من قبل الـ الـ الإرهاب استهدفوا من قبل العناصر الإرهابية والتجمعات الإرهابية بشكل مباشر وبالتالي العراق الآن كان قبل الغزو الأمريكي كان العراق يوجد فيه حوالي مليونين مسيح الآن في العراق لا يوجد سوى 250 أو أقل ألف مسيح والأغلبية هاجرت الآن إلى ألمانيا وهاجرت إلى أوروبا وهاجرت إلى إنجلترا وهاجرت إلى أمريكا ولذلك الآن هذا العنصر الذي كان قد ساهم ومساهم فعال في صناعة الثقافة العراقية وحتى الإسلامية يعني ما يسمى بالثقافة العربية الإسلامية 
هذه كيف تكونت؟ تكونت من خلال تفاعل هذه العناصر وايضا المسيحيون كانوا العنصر الاساس في تكوين ما يسمى بالثقافه العربيه الاسلاميه في عصرها العظيم في عصر بغداد ايام العباسيين. هذه الثقافه تكونت اولا في من عنصر اساسي وهو الترجمه. يعني العرب عندما خرجوا من الجزيره العربيه لم يكن يحملون فلسفه ولم يكن يحملون علوم ولكن عندما جاءوا الى بغداد ودمشق والقاهره واستقروا هنالك خصوصا في بغداد واقاموا عاصمتهم في بغداد احتاجوا الى الترجمه وبالتالي وصلت اليهم الثقافه الاغريقيه والرومانيه التي فيها الفلسفه الاغريقيه وهنا بداوا بتكوين ما يسمى الفلسفه العربيه الاسلاميه يعني الفلسفه العربيه الاسلاميه تدين في عنصر كبير جدا هو الى المسيحيين العراقيين الصابي واسحاق بن حنين وحنين بن اسحاق وغيرهم وبالتالي ساهموا مساهمه فعاله جدا في خلق هذه الثقافه الان في العراق الحديث ايضا المسيحيون ساهموا مساهمه فعاله في تكوين ما يسمى بالمجتمع العراقي الحديث من لانهم كانوا اكثر تنويرا وايضا ساهموا مساهمة فعالة في بناء المدارس والجامعات وغيرها وحتى الأقوام الأخرى التي هاجرت يعني أول الحرفيين في العراق كانوا أرمن عندما تكملت الدولة العراقية في عام 1921 لم يكن هناك حرفيين كثيرين في العراق في هذه الفترة كان هناك أرمن جاءوا بعد المذبحة التي قامها العثمانيون في عام 1916 في الحرب العالمية الأولى وبالتالي جاء إلى العراق موجة كبيرة جدا من الأرمن وسكنوا العراق الجميل في سكن الأرمن أنهم لم يستقروا في مكان واحد تراهم في الموصل في الشمال وتراهم في بغداد الوسط تراهم في البصرة في الجنوب ولذلك أصبحوا جزءا من المجتمع العراقي وساهموا مساهمة فعالة جدا في إضافة نسيج جميل إلى المجتمع العراقي وأيضا كان لهم دور كبير جدا يعني هؤلاء هم الحرفيون الأوائل يعني مثلا المصورين الأوائل كانوا أرمن الحرفيين في التعدين والسيارات كانوا هم أرمن الكهربائيون الأول الذي اشتغلون في الكهرباء كانوا هم أرمن وبالتالي هذه هذا العنصر الذي ساهم ومساهم فعال في تكوين هذا وبالتالي هذا العنصر رغم مجيء لا يتجاوز المئة سنة ساهم ومساهم فعال في بناء الثقافة العراقية فما بالك في المسيحيون الذين هم قد سبق المسلمون في العراق داعش عندما جاءت 2014 إلى العراق وقبلها القاعدة وأخواتها كانوا قد استهدفوا الرموز الثقافية العراقية المسيحية والأزيدية هذه الرموز لأنها تمثل عنصراً يدين الأحادية يدين التطرف يدين, يدين, يدين الإلغاء الآخرين وذلك ماذا فعلوا ليس فقط استهدفوا الإنسان المسيحي أو استهدفوا الإنسان الأزيدي لكنهم استهدفوا هاي المراكز الثقافية لأن وجودها يعني وجود هؤلاء الناس في هذه الأرض دائما الإنسان يتواجد في أرضه التي له معها ذكريات دينية أو حياتية أو ثقافية عندما تدمر هذه الرموز الدينية والثقافية فأن هناك عنصر كبير جدا من ضرورة وجود الإنسان في أرضه تنتهي ولذلك هم حاولوا أن يلغوا لكي يجعلوا من هذه الأرض أرضا يبابا ليس فيها تنويع جاهزة لهم في طرح أفكارهم المتطرفة وذلك أزالوا أغلب الكنائس المسيحية في الموصل الموصل التي تم السيطرة عليها منذ ثلاثة سنوات كانوا قد هدموا أغلب الكنائس التاريخية العظيمة في الموصل الموصل ساهمت مساهمة فعالة في بناء ما يسمى الثقافة المسيحية كانت هناك ثقافة مسيحية شرقية تمثلها الموصل وهناك ثقافة مسيحية شامية وبالتالي الأدب المسيحي كتب في الموصل الثقافة المسيحية كتبت في الموصل ولذلك عندما استهدفوا هذه الرموز العظيمة فأنه استهدفوا جوهر الثقافة المسيحية الآن هل الحل في أن نهجر هذه يعني إذا كنا نساعد المسيحيين والأزيدين على الانتقال إلى دولة أخرى هذا يعني نحن أصبحنا دواعش هذا يعني نحن نريد أن نحقق الهدف الذي جاءوا من أجله هؤلاء الأكستريمست وهؤلاء المتطرفون 
الذين يريدون لغة واحدة وثقافة واحدة وعنصرا واحدا وطائفة واحدة ولا يسمحون بالتنويع والحياة لديهم هي العودة إلى الماضي بلون واحد ولا بلس واحد وغيرها ولهذا فإننا بعض الأحيان نساعد عليها أنا ألقيت كلمة أيضا في مؤتمر الأقليات الذي يسمى في جنيف في عام 2018 وقلت يجب أولا أن نلغي كلمة الأقليات minorities. وثانيا يجب أن لا نساعد المسيحيين والأزيديين على الانتقال من العراق ويجب أن نحقق لهم شيئا نجعل لهم محميات في العراق نساعدهم عن طريق القوانين عن طريق حتى عن طريق القوة ممكن نساعدهم للبقاء في أرضهم لأنه خروج هذا المكون الأساسي الأصيل المهم في العراق يؤدي إلى إلغاء كما قلت لكم الثقافة العراقية تكونت عبر آلاف السنين والأزيديون والمسيحيين كانوا عنصرا مهمة جدا الآن عندما تلغي هذا العنصر فإنك بالتأكيد تأكيد ستؤدي إلى انهيار الثقافة العراقية ثقافة العراقية كانت تسترد على التنوع يعني أنا شخصيا أنا درست في مدارس في بغداد في الدورة أو في الكرادة أنا الصف الذي أنا أسكن فيه إلى جانب مسيحي ولا جانب كردي ولا خلفي سني ولا آخر شيء وغيرها كنا لا ندري نحتفل باحتفالات المسيحيين ولا ندري نحتفل باحتفالات المسلمين وغيرها يعني هذا العنصر كان التقبل الكبير المسيحيون كانوا يساهمون في الاحتفالات الدينية وكان هم الذين يعدون طعام الفطور للمسلمين أثناء رمضان كان عنصر أساسي هو هو احترام المقابل عيد العياد المسيحية كان كل الشيعة وكل السنة وكل المسلمين يساهمون فيها كان تقبل كان مجتمع منفتح كان مجتمع متسامع كان مجتمع متنوع الآن عندما أنت تلغي هذا العنصر ورموزه يأتي جيل لم يتعود على التنوع ولا يتعود على التسامح سيكون جيلا صلفا صلدا متوحدا حاسما قاسيا لا يريد إلا أحادية كلون الصحراء السماء صحراء علي if you can if you can please summarize your points thank you okay. Okay. إذا إذا يجب أن نساعد على بقاء هذا العنصر اليزيدي وعلى العنصر المسيحي في العراق وعدم مساعدتهم على الهجرة خارج العراق لأن وجودهم يساعد على بقاء التنوع ويساعدهم على بقاء الثقافة العراقية التي سند أساسا على التنوع وأيضا نساعدهم على إعادة بناء الرموز الدينية والمعابد في لالش وفي الشيخان وغيرها لليزيديين وأيضا الكنائس المسيحية الكثيرة ومنها التاريخية التي هدمت في الموصل شكرا جزيلا Thank you Dr. Ali Now we move to our last speaker Mr. Ala Sayyid Mr. Ala is a lawyer and also historian from Syria and he will be explaining why the heritage and the cultural diversity are at risk in Syria He will be talking in Arabic Thank you Thank you أولا أنا مالي دكتور أنا محامي وناشط ومقيم بمدينة حلب طوال فترة الحرب السورية بس حبيت أوضح الفكرة هاي بالنسبة لح أستعرض اليوم الإبادة التراثية الثقافية اللي أصابت سوريا خلال الحرب الأخيرة واللي هي بتشبه كتير يمكن اللي صار بالعراق اللي حكى عليه الدكتور علي وبتشبه كتير اللي حكى عليه السيد سيمون اللي صار بيناقون كرباخ رح أصلت الضوء على الدمار اللي أصاب الأوابط الأسرية اللي هي بتعكس الثقافة والحضارة اللي هي موجودة بمدينة حلب اللي بترجع عمر من مدينة مثل ما بيعرفوا أغلب اللي عم بيسمعوني لألاف السنين تم انتقاء مجموعة من الأبنية خلال الحرب ما بين 2013 و2015 في مدينة حلب ميرة بشكل ممنهج عن طريق حفر أنفاق تحت وضع كميات ضخمة من المتفجرات كان التفجيرات ممكن من إحنا موجودين في حلب أنا كنت ببعد عن هالأبنية هاي حوالي ستة أو سبعة كيلومتر كنت أحس به زلزال بيصيب البيت بدرجة أربعة ليختر تقريبا أكثر هو المبنى الأساسي اللي تعرض للهجوم هو قلعة حلب التاريخية قلعة حلب عمرها حوالي أربعة آلاف سنة تعرضت لحوالي مية وخمسين هجوم مسلح 150 خلال ثلاث سنين وتأدت طبعا وحوالي 13 نفق انحفر تحتها وصار فيها تفجيرات أدى لانهيار أجزاء مهمة من أسوار التاريخية ثم للأسف تم انتقاء مجموعة من المباني المحيطة بقلعة حلب 
واللي هي قلب المدينة القديمة وانتقاءهم كان أنا برأيي ما هو عشوائي انتقاء ومنهج راح أصلت الضوء على نماذج منهم المبنى الأول اللي تم تفجيره بنفق اسمه جامع السلطانية الأيوبي يرجع للعهد الأيوبي الزعهد صلاح الدين الأيوبي مدفون في ملك حلب ابن صلاح الدين الأيوبي الظاهر غازي عمر هالجامع هذا حوالي 800 سنة تم تدميره تقريبا بالكامل بجانبه كان في حمام يشبه الحمامات الرومانية المعروفة بالعالم كله ولكن هو من عصر الممدوكي اسمه حمام يلبغى عمره 600 سنة تم تدميره كمان بجانب منه في مدرسة أربعة مدرسة خصوبية هي من العهد العثماني 400 عام من التدريس في هالمدرسة هي تم محيا وتحويلها لحفرة عمقة شي حوالي سبعة أو ثمان أمتار المبنى تقريبا الأخير هو المكتبة الوقفية هي مكتبة عمر مئات السنين في المدينة بتجمع أهم مخطوطات النادرة تم طبعا الامر ما كان يكتفي بالجوامع تم تدمير قسم كبير من الكنائس الموجوده بحي الجديده، الكنائس اللي نعرف في حلب في الطائفه المسيحيه يعني كان في كنائس ارمنيه وكنائس كاثوليكيه وكنائس ارثوذكسيه مختلفه مختلفه الاشكال. طبعا كان الطامه الكبرى بالنسبه لمدينتنا هي تدمير مئزنت الجامع الأموي الكبير جامع بيرجع عمره لحوالي أكثر من ألف سنة تم تدمير مئزنت الفريدة بالعالم بالكامل انهارت هذا كان يوم أسود في تاريخ المدينة هلا بالنسبة لي أنا لما بشوف أنه بتدمر جامع فيه طريح لابنه لصلاح الدين أيوبي فأنت بتدمر فترة كتير أساسية بتاريخ المدينة هي الفترة الأيوبية لما بتدمر حمام عام حمامات السوق نحن نسميها هذا الحمام خلال 600 سنه الناس كانوا يروحوا يغتسلوا فيه لاغتسال بحلب ضمن الحمام السوق يكون له طقوس احتفاليه طقوس مجتمعيه بيلتقوا فيه الناس بيعزفوا موسيقى فهذا تراث ثقافي لا يمكن تعويضه عندما بتدمر مدرسه المدرسه الخسروفيه 400 سنه هي عم تخرج اطفال بتعلموا بيدرسوا فيها من اعرق المدارس بتدمرها بشكل كامل فانت عم بتدمر التعليم وبالاخير لما بتدمر مئزنه امويه اللي حكينا عليها بالجامع الاموي الكبير فانت عم بتدمر تراث معماري عمره اكثر من 1000 سنه فريد بالعالم داخله كان في محراب خشبي موصنوع بطريقه حلبيه خاصه بالجاره الحلبيه اللي معروفه بالعالم باسم الارابيسك تم سرقته هذا المحراب وضاع الحياه المكتبه الوقفيه اللي تم حرقها بالكامل كان فيها حوالي 35 هسه انا كملت المحاضره لا ما احتاج حتى هذا ما احتاج عفوا مستر دكتور علي كان يو بليز ميوت فروم يور يس يو كان كونتينيو مستر علاء سيف هلا انا اخترت اخترت هالنماذج هي بشكل عام لحتى اوضح انه الاباده الجماعيه اللي تعرضتها مدينه حلب عبر تدمير ابنيه الاسريه هي هي إبادة كانت تستهدف التاريخ الثقافي، التاريخ العلمي، التاريخ المجتمعي لمجموعة السكان عراقتون، علاقتهم بمدينتون، طفولتون، مدارسون اللي هي بتدخل في وجدان كل إنسان لما بيكون تدميرها بهالقصر وبهالعنف هذا ممكن نعتبره من أهم طرق الإبادة الجماعية اللي ممكن ما استهدفت الإنسان بشكل مباشر ولكن استهدفت عمق تفكيره وتراثه هلأ الشيء اللي نقدر أنا أستعرضه أنه نحن ك فينا بالمدينة وكان لازم نعمل مبادرات لحاولت أنقاذ ما يمكن أنقاذه أطلقنا مبادرة كانت الحكي بال2013 بداية الحرب العنيفة اللي كانت موجودة بمدينة حلب كانت حلب بدون ماء أو كهرباء أو كان الانترنت بيجي من فترات كتير محدودة ما كان في وقود لوسائل المواصلات كانت حلب محاصرة تقريبا بالكامل فترات متقطعة فبادرنا لحتى نعمل مبادرة أطلقناها نحن مجموعة من الشباب المتطوعين كان اسمها أرشيف حلب الوطني نادت هالمبادرة بأنه نحن ننقذ ما يمكن أنقاذه من الوسائل من الكتب من الجرائد من الذكريات من التسجيلات الصوتية من ما تبقى من السكان كنا ندخل على الأبنية اللي مخربة اللي مقصوفة ننتشر من تحت الأنقاض مكتبات منزلية صور 
ممكن تكون عائليه ندخل على المكتبات العامه نحول كل هال هال هالورقيات هي كل هالوثائق نحولها لمحتوى ديجيتال محتوى رقمي نرفعها كنا على النت لانه كان عندنا ايمان كامل بانه ممكن تحترق وتزول اذا رفعت على النت وكانت قابله للتحميل مجانا بكل انحاء العالم فيمكن كان طريقه لانقاذها طبعا في كثير من الاشياء مثلا المكتبه الوقفيه وثقناها وتحولت لمحتوى رقمي بعد للاسف احترقت وانفقدت ولا يمكن تعويضها. لما توقفت اعمال قتاليه بمدينه حلب بدايه عام 2017 كان لازم نعمل مبادره ايجابيه ثانيه اطلقنا مبادره سميناها اصدقاء باب النصر. باب النصر هو احد ابواب المدينه التاريخيه برجع عمره لحوالي 300 سنه بشكله الحالي هو عمره ممكن يرجع للعصر الهلنستي يعني حوالي 2000 سنه. بوابة المدينة كانت معرضة للتدمير اخترنا هذه البوابة بالذات لإعادة ترميمة بجهودنا الشخصية بوجود مقام ديني مزار فيها هالمقام المسيحية بيزوروا لبعتبروه مقام مار جرجوس والمسلمين بيزوروا بعتبروه مقام خضر الخضر عليه السلام فكان اعتبرنا رمز هالبوابة إضافة لبعد التاريخي هي بتحوي مكان ممكن يرتادوا كل الطوائف الدينية الموجودة في مدينة حلب ترجع تجمعون اعتبرنا نحن مثل تذكار للمصيبة اللي أصابت المدينة هاي وطريقة لحتى نرجع نجمع الناس باللقاء رغم الفوارق الطائفية أو الدينية أو الاجتماعية قدرنا خلال سنتين نرمم هالمكان بالكامل وقدرنا نرجع الناس ترجع تزوره بكل اشكالهم شجعنا حتى فرق الكشافه الكشافه الاطفال الصغار اللي بقى يعني بالمدينه بمختلف اديانهم وطوائفهم صار في تقليد انه يجوا يشعلوا شمعه ضمن هالضريح الديني لرمز لانه لابد من عوده الضوء حتى يطرد الظلام هلا بعد ما خلصنا مبادره مبادرتين بالاولى مثل ما حكينا بارشفت التوثيق وتحويله لمحتوى ديجيتال للوثائق الموجوده ومبادره ترميم باب النصر والضريح اللي فيه اطلقنا مبادره ثالثه سميناها دار وثائق رقميه ما فعلناها بالمبادره الاولى وقدرنا نوثق حوالي مئات الاف الصور والتسجيلات والكتب والجرائد والوثائق والتسجيلات الصوتيه والتسجيلات المرئيه وحم... وعملناها بموقع انترنت وعلى الشبكه وصار ممكن الناس بدرات نحن كنا حريصين انه نرفقها بحملات اعلاميه حتى نحفز الناس في كل في في كل ارجاء مدينه حلب وفي كل ارجاء المدن السوريه يعني نحفزهم انه يتبنوا مواقع معينه ويرجعوا يرمموها ممكن تكون اطرحه دينيه ممكن تكون مكتبات ممكن تكون دور عباده ممكن تكون اي شيء وكان هذا التحفيز الايجابي له له منعكس كثير مهم هلا يمكن نحن قدرنا نحقق بعض الاهداف وكان لنا دور ايجابي واعتبرنا بانه انه مثل ما بيقولوا ان تشعل شمعة خير من تلعن الظلام وما راح نكتفي انا بعتقد وهذا واجب على كل ال الشيء اللي سمعناه ما حدا يكتفي بالادانه والشجب لازم ينزل على الارض يقوم بواجبه باي جهد كان شكرا لك ثانك يو مستر علاء فور ذيس امبورتنت برزنتيشن سو از وي ريتش تو اند ذير ار تو كويشنز اي ويل جاست ريد ذا كويشن اند ميبي If the speakers uh, they are free uh, to answer. the first question is about actually it's interesting because it's about the uh, the culture rights or the cultural destruction of the olive trees. I mean, in West Bank, in occupied Palestine, uh, that are being damaged by the Israeli set settlers. So the question is that uh, is the destruction of the olive trees also a violation of cultural rights uh, according to international law? So if one of the speakers like. to answer this question maybe dr hernar since you talk about human rights and cultural preservation thank you thank you for this question it's a very interesting question um there are um, um measures in place uh, for the protection of the natural world in international cultural heritage 
But um, in addition to that, of course, the cultivation of the olive is not only an agricultural activity, it is also a deeply cultural activity um, around the Mediterranean and for Palestinians especially, very deeply meaningful and symbolic. So um, I, I agree with you. Um, I think I would, um, uh, I, I think there's an argument to be made that the destruction of the olives is uh, part of a destruction of, of culture. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the second question is about the countries that have suffered from problems of civil wars and genocides and so on. And uh, now they have been, a, I mean, how they have been able actually to create a peaceful coexistence between conflicting societies, uh, the role of transitional justice and special courts for truth and reconciliation. If anyone, maybe uh, Dr. Roy, I don't know if you can answer or if anyone likes to volunteer to answer this question. Actually, I do not understand the question. It's, it's a little uh, bit. Yeah, mixed the question. Up. Yeah, the question is about actually the countries that have suffered uh, problems from the civil war and genocides and crimes. Um, maybe if we can provide some examples about uh, post-genocide or post-war coexistence or reconciliation between conflicting societies. I think Rwanda is one of the examples. Uh, maybe that it's a post-genocide, though reconciliation is a bit... Uh... Yeah, I mean, in Rwanda, they have these kind of um, gachacha um, trials, which are trials um, uh, in different villages uh, where the villagers will trial the genocidaires. But as I understand the literature, this is that was a nice move and it, they tried it, but in the end it failed. I mean, it, it, it not really um, led to conciliation. I mean, so, but this is maybe, maybe one, one way to do this. I mean, if you, if you say you do it on the local level and not only on the international level, which is also important as well, maybe for the political landscape, but I mean, I, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but it's, I think there is no real conciliation um, afterwards. So there's maybe this memorial site, which we uh, addressed um, in, this, uh, uh, in this webinar today, but, but on the political and on the society level, I think genocidal violence destroys the social um, uh, foundations of every society and you, you you cannot really cope with it I guess so it's a little pessimistic but this is what what I think and what I see from a historical point of view I mean if you look in the history of genocides in the 20th and 21st century now sorry for yes. this answer but yeah yeah I think I mean recall, reconciliation is a bit difficult without transitional justice. I think uh, this is what I believe, and this is what uh, is happening. Um, so, as we have finished, uh, I mean, uh, on behalf of the organizers, I would like uh, to thank uh, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Bye.